We're glad to be here tonight. For those of you that don't know us, I am Mary Jo Nutting and my husband, Dave. I see you don't have your whole name on there, Dave. Uh, I see a Dave, though. <laughs> yeah, I see a Dave. <laughs> and uh, we are the founders and the directors of Alpha Omega Institute, and, and uh, we are very happy to be with you. I think probably most of you have some connection with AOI in the past. Is there anybody that hasn't? doesn't know anything about AOI. I think we did most of our advertising through our closer contacts this time. So uh, we established Alpha Omega Institute in 1984. And so we've been going for quite a long time here. Mm -hmm. um, and I am just going to uh, hold on a second here. There we go. Uh, there we go. Um, yes. So we didn't always believe in creation. Actually, I believed in creation when I was a kid. And I went to Sunday school, I went to church, I read the Bible, my mom and dad read the Bible to me, and I believed in, I believed in creation. I believed what the Bible said. But then going to school, I was taught the idea of evolution. And so I didn't know what to do with that. I just kind of took both of these two ideas of creation and evolution and Tried to hold them side by side. Uh, that didn't work too well, but it, but it kind of, it got me through school, I guess. I thought evolution was a scientific explanation for the origin of life and everything that we see on the earth today. And I thought creation was a religious explanation. And so in high school, I just drew a line down the middle. I put evolution on one side, I put creation on the other side, and they never really met. But then uh, I went to a church college, my first year of college. What would you think they would teach at a church college? Or what would you hope they would teach, creation or evolution? Creation. I was hoping they would teach creation. I expected them to teach creation. I expected them to teach the Bible. But uh, I got to that church college, and they told me that Genesis was a myth that was written for primitive people who couldn't understand the science of evolution. And they said that uh, the... And they said that those days in Genesis were really representative of periods of time, millions of years long, and God must have used evolution as his method of creating. And I thought, oh, okay, now I can take science, what I thought was science, and I can take what I thought the Bible taught, and I can put them together. And for a while, that sort of satisfied me. But uh, over in the biology classes at that church college, they taught evolution the same as it would be taught in any other public university. And so that, you know, that was a little confusing to me. The religion classes did not honor God's word either. You know, there were all kinds of things there that uh, were not were not aligning up with God's word. But uh, the other problem was that the school was very much known as a party school, which I did not know when I went there as a freshman. And I was not ready for that. I was not prepared for the social peer pressure and the, the uh, just the force of which, which those schools were party schools. And consequently, my life just went down the tubes for a period of time. I stayed at that school one year. I went from there to a public university and in the public university, of course, they don't teach God used evolution. They just teach evolution, no God. And uh, I was not real um, consistent, I think, praise God, because I still held on somehow to faith in God. But, but I was really indoctrinated in the evolution model. I, I really believed evolution was true. And I thought, well, yes, God could have used evolution. I went through college that way, and finally after college, uh, we graduated, both Dave and I, from Colorado State University. We went on to teach, at, first at a public school level, and then we went on later on to a, uh, to a college level up in Alaska. Went to a little church college in Alaska, and, and they didn't care that we taught evolution. The whole, the whole uh, biology department was evolutionary. The whole science department was. And, you know, 
that's the way it is. I'm, a, I'm sad to say in a lot of so-called Christian colleges, it's really sad to me because I think if you don't understand creation from the very beginning, you end up shooting yourself in the foot before you ever get started, really. The, the scripture very clearly says God is creator. And if you ever want to do a fascinating Bible study, look through the whole of scripture and you're going to find out that uh, creation is taught everywhere. There's, there's nothing that really indicates an evolutionary model. But I was taught evolution. So when the science books taught evolution, that's all I knew. I didn't know there was another side to the story. But God likes to really intervene in our life, doesn't he? And one day I was shopping in a little secondhand store up there in Alaska, and I found a book called Evolution, The Fossils Say No by Dr. Duane Gish. It was just a teeny tiny little book at that point in time. And I bought the book for five cents. Best, best nickel I ever spent. <laughs> and uh, I brought that book home. I read it and I went, wow, I thought the fossils proved evolution. And here Dr. Gish is saying, no, they don't prove evolution. In fact, they're a problem for evolution. And so I gave the book to Dave. He had a better background in, in paleontology and fossils and stuff than I did. And he read the book and... We both went at that time, you know, this guy's either crazy or he knows something we don't know. And we said, we better start doing some research of our own. And the more that we studied at that point, the more convinced we became that creation was a much better model scientifically than evolution. And then later on, we went back and we looked at the scriptures and we said, how in the world could we ever think that, uh, that the Bible could teach evolution? you know, when we went back and studied scripture. So we became very convinced of, of creation. And we were really excited that there was evidence to support and affirm the biblical account, that we didn't have to stretch the evidence. We didn't have to leave stuff out. We didn't have to try to take and reinterpret evidence, but the evidence itself fit very clearly with what the scripture was teaching. Over the years, we have come to understand that, that evolution is probably the biggest reason why students don't accept the biblical account. It's the biggest reason that students give for, for rejecting the gospel and rejecting the Christian faith. And we became very convinced of that when we had a student in Alaska who, he was a great student. He was a wildlife biology major. He, he and Dave used to go out and go fishing and hunting and doing all kinds of fun stuff. And they'd talk about all kinds of things. But whenever Dave got anywhere close to anything spiritual, the student would just close right up. And finally, finally, Dave asked him why. And he says, Dave, I can't buy this Jesus stuff. Why not, Jeff, Dave said. Well, Jeff says, because evolution is a fact, that means Genesis is false. He said, if God can't get the first book of the Bible right, why would I believe anything else he has to say? And really, that was a pretty good point. And uh, we didn't have all the answers at that time. We were just starting out learning some things about creation and evolution. But what we did do is we had Dr. Henry Morris from the Institute for Creation Research. Came to those lectures. And at the end of the time, he says, if evolution isn't true, that doesn't leave much, does it? He said, I better start doing some thinking. And within just a couple months, Jeff became a Christian because now he had a foundation for faith. Now he could believe Genesis, that God is the creator. And he could understand that, that mankind had, had rebelled against God, that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And and the whole, the whole account of the creation and the fall and the later the destruction by the flood and so on. And so at that point, I think is when, when Dave and I really felt like God was calling us into creation ministry. And uh, we, we ended up going out to the Institute for Creation Research, spent some time learning out there, um, powerful time with those guys who were all kind of leaders in the creation movement at that point in time and very formative in our lives. And then in 1984, like I said, we started the Alpha Omega Institute, mostly just because we wanted to be able to go and teach others what we had learned. And so tonight, in this, in this uh, four-day 
seminar conference, what we want to do is a basic overview of creation evidences. For some of you, this may be brand new. For others, it may be stuff that's a review for you. But uh, we would encourage you, if it's, if it's review and if, if you've heard it before, we would really encourage you to invite others to uh, get your friends on here um, tomorrow night. You can watch the replays. They would be able to get on and watch the replays so that they wouldn't miss anything. And uh, we really want to encourage you to do that. And we are going to be inviting you at the end of the time to sign up for um, some other classes that we will be doing. Brian Mariani will be doing a class starting in August, a six week, one night a week class on astronomy. And then uh, another one of our staff people, um, Scott Mauser, will be, will be doing a class following Brian's uh, after that six weeks. Um, Scott will be doing a class on the reliability of scripture. And these classes that we're doing are the same classes that are involved with the Discover Creation Training Institute that, uh, that we have at AOI. And so, you know, over a period of a couple of years, if people stick with us, they will get a, a really good, strong basis in creation. And so if you know people that, that uh, should be in there, we just want to encourage you as you go through these, these sessions tonight and, and for the next three nights, encouraging you to think about who could you invite to come to these classes. And, and so we'll be looking at that. You want to go ahead and um, yeah, put up, go ahead and click the slides. All right. So you're on the title slide, right? I'm on the title slide. And yeah. what we're looking at is the fact that science cries out creation. All right. And uh, so that's uh, what we've titled that. And uh, we are hoping to get people to be able to see our um, uh, various, I got to click on that. Uh, we're hoping people will, will see the importance of this issue and then come to the next group of the sessions that'll be repeated from tonight in August, starting August 8. And we're hoping to expand this over, uh, more and more and more and to get a lot of people in, uh, in on this material because young people are getting hammered by evolution. They need to know where to turn. And we're mm -hmm. hoping that these sessions will be a place they can come to. And now, when uh, we go back, when we go back to Genesis, we want to we want to make sure you all have that firm foundation in Genesis. But mm -hmm. mostly we're going to be talking science tonight. Yeah. But when we look at Genesis 1 and 2, um, I believe that you can use this as a real strong outline to understand the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which really lay the foundation for the rest of Scripture. But the interesting thing is that same outline lays a firm foundation for understanding science. And, and let, let me show you what I mean here. Genesis 1 and 2, you're very familiar with, right? Genesis 1 being a chronological overview of the creation. Genesis 2 focusing in on the creation of Adam and Eve. And, uh, and so we, we have Genesis 1 and 2, which focus on creation. And we like to say focus on design. When we're looking at the world around us, we see evidence of design in nature. And that evidence fits with what we read in Genesis 1 and 2. It just affirms it. It helps to, to support what we read there. But then we get to Genesis 3 to 5, and, and people will say, well, if God created everything and it was all very good, like it says in the scripture, then what happened to this good earth? Genesis 3 to 5 explains what things happened when, when Adam... Now, ate that fruit, it says, by one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And so in, in Genesis 3 to 5, we read about the entrance of sin into the world and how it destroyed relationships, destroyed, um, well, the physical, even the physical uh, creation with thorns and thistles and death. And of design, but we also see evidence of mutations and natural selection and death and decay and disease. 
and fighting and so on. Then we get to Genesis 6 through 8, and we read about the judgment that comes because of sin. Because the whole world, it says, was filled with violence and wickedness. And God finally said, enough is enough. And he told Noah, build the boat, right? Better be a big one. You're going to need it. And he built the ark. He obeyed God. He heard God. He obeyed him. He believed him. But we know that the rest of the world, the unbelieving world, did not believe. And they did not get on board that, that boat. And so we see evidence of the flood, which was a judgment on sin and cleansing, really, of the earth. And we will find out as we get to that part about the flood, we see very many evidences all around the world that there really was a worldwide flood. And Dave will be talking about that on uh, Wednesday. I Wednesday. And then uh, Genesis 9 through 11 is after the flood. We might call it Babel and beyond because the, we, we read about the Tower of Babel. We read about humanity trying to be one and trying to worship the host of heaven and trying to make a name for themselves and to not be spread over the earth. And yet God had told them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And so we're going to see in Genesis 9 through 11, the, the dispersion of the people groups throughout the earth when God came down and said, nope, that's not going to work. He confused their languages. They spread out around the earth. And, and so when we look at when we look at this overview, we see design, we see evidence of, the de of death and decay and evil, we see evidence of destruction with the flood, and we see evidence of the dispersion. And I believe as we look at scientific evidence, much of it you're going to be able to fit into one of those four categories as you really start thinking about it. But it also provides us with a firm foundation for understanding the rest of Scripture. And so <clears throat> we're going to come back to that outline various times because I, I just want you to really get it into your heart, into your mind. I would encourage you between now and tomorrow night sometime to read through Genesis 1 through 11 and maybe read it with as if it was the first time you'd ever seen it. Okay. <laughs> Just read it, read it with that idea of saying, wow, you know, what is this narrative I'm reading about the early earth and the history of people on the earth and God's power in creating and so on? Yeah, I'm going to throw something in there just as a teaser uh, that uh, on that Gen 11 day, which would be on Thursday, Babel and Dispersion. Uh, that's where I'm going to be a, a good share presentation is going to be talking about dinosaurs. And you might say, what? What do you mean putting dinosaurs there? Well, stay tuned. You'll find out. <laughs> it's a little bit of a teaser. We're also going to be talking about the Ice Age in Genesis 9 to 11. And uh, stay tuned how that all fits together. And so there's some good stuff that's coming up. So tonight we're going to be focusing in more on Genesis 1 to 2, creation and design. Okay. And uh, when I look at the, the things around me, I see design. I see evidence of God's hand. But I used to not see that. I used to be an evolutionist myself until I started having my eyes open and the Lord allowed me to see his tremendous goodness and his design. Tonight's session of this uh, uh, Science Cries Out creation is, can you believe the Bible? Grand design or blind chance? And uh, this is a session I would hope the thousands of young people across the United States would be able to see this. Uh, and so that's part of our job here is to begin expanding this out so that we will be able to see this message reaching thousands. Of course, this whole backdrop is creation versus evolution, isn't it? The idea did God create things, man in God's image, or did we come about by goo turning into you by way of the zoo? Uh, there are two ways of viewing it, isn't it? And, um, I uh, just want to let you know that a lot of people think creation is just a religious myth. 
Whereas evolution, the goo to you by way of the zoo, is science. And uh, I'm going to mention it right off the bat that evolution is not science. It's a philosophy of how we got here, but it's posing as science. And it's a pillar of what's called naturalism, that everything in the universe has to be explained only by natural processes, which exclude God. And that's what uh, people are being taught all the time, aren't they? And so we're going to be looking at that. And uh, I want you to understand what I mean by all this. Big Bang, naturalism. What does that mean? That the universe burst into something from absolutely totally committed to naturalism is trying to tell us. All right, there's the quote right there on the front cover. The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff <laughs> that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? You know, how can you uh, get nothing and have it explode? You know, that doesn't sound a lot like science, does it? All right. Um, so keep that in mind. How can that happen? And then, of course, in the naturalistic worldview, you now have uh, the, you might say, gas molecules floating around in our uh, solar system, wherever it came from, and lightning zapped through those particular atmos that atmosphere, hit the chemicals, made big bigger chemicals, which are called amino acids. And those amino acids lined up like beads on a string to form the first protein, that plus a thousand other things got together to form the first cell all strictly by naturalistic processes, some accidents. And then that cell became you, goo to you by way of the zoo. All right, but the problem is this, that's all naturalism, only natural processes, no God involved. Although some people try to put God using evolution as his, his method of creating. And that's what Mary Jo was taught at a church college. And, um, but pe young people are in the classroom. They're being chained to the idea of naturalism. That's the only way that you can explain anything if you want to be a scientist, right? And um, that's what they're taught. Uh, so they end up um, graduating uh, from high school already believing in naturalism because that's all they have ever been taught. And pretty soon, even in high school, even in middle school, they're already professing naturalism. You have to not can't or you can't have God if you uh, believe in uh, if you want to be a scientist. That's what they're seeing. Well, see, these young people are taken captive through the philosophy of what naturalism and evolution. They're being taken captive and uh, unfortunately um we hit the university campus and we see a lot of christian young people all taken captive by naturalism it turns out that number one reason students give rejecting the gospel happens to be evolution uh it's also the main reason students uh leave the church and that number is really scary of the young people attending evangelical church churches and living in evangelical church homes, by the time they graduate from college, the number is 72 to 85% of them have already left the church. And so that's so sad to see that, that so many people are being taken captive by the philosophy of evolution. You know, I wish every one of those students could hear this particular program because I believe the evidence cries out things were created with a design all the way from the universe itself 
to the DNA in our body and even the things that are even going on deeper into the cell, okay? I see design, but I hear students all the time tell me, you can't tell if something was designed. No, maybe it just all happened by natural processes. After all, we have billions of years to play with. Well, I think you can tell things were designed. God says you can. Uh, he says, for the, since the creation of the world, you can also even see as God's invisible attributes uh, being understood by the things that are made. So not only can we tell there was a design and there was a creator, but we can tell something about that powerful creator. And it continues in uh, verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools. And that's if they are really not acknowledging the creator God. And then they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man in birds and animals and creeping things. And that sounds an awful lot to me like evolution. And yes, I can tell something was designed. I know that rock does not take that shape naturally. Those are arrowheads. It looks like there's order imposed on a natural uh, substance. I also know that that painting did not come as a result of an explosion in a paint factory. Okay, that is fairly obvious to me as well. But when I look at the natural world, I see evidence of design as well. Uh, think about the dolphins. And uh, here's what Discover Magazine uh, says. Remember, they're committed to naturalism. Everything has to be explained by natural processes. And uh, they talk about the life in a sea, leaving a dolphin baked, crushed, and sterile. Well, first of all, why would it be baked? Well, it's a water mammal. And uh, water mammals expend an awful lot of energy, don't they? And when you expend that kind of energy, you're going to produce a lot of heat. And, um, and so it would uh, basically bake, except for the fact that uh, it has a very good cooling system. And the cooling system happens to be wrapped up in that dorsal fin, the water and then the vessel, water vessel, or the water is actually um, uh, touches and comes in contact, close contact, you might say, with blood vessels that actually are cooled by the water and by this interchange, the special technical terms that go along with that. But there are technical things that causes the blood to be cooled to the perfect temperature. And when it gets to the perfect temperature, then the blood goes back in and cools the rest of the body system. All right. And so let's continue with what the Discover magazine says. Just on this one point, it says this graceful mammal avoids such a fate only by slipping through the loopholes in the laws of physiology. Now that sounds awfully scientific, but it said nothing. It has no expectation explanation whatsoever. It's just a statement that throws a coat of paint over a very hard to explain thing about how evolutionary processes will produce that. And so that's what we see, just a may have, uh, might have type of explanations. Well, let me give you another example. The bombardier beetle basically is a beetle that can shoot out liquid um, an almost fiery type of substance into the face of an enemy. It can shoot with machine gun blast rapidity, mixes two chemicals together, and it has a special storage compartment for those uh, chemicals. It has uh, uh, mixing chambers, several sets of valves and explosion chambers, and when it's all said and done, you have at least 212 degrees Fahrenheit liquids and gases being shot into the face of an approaching frog. If you saw it at night, you would see a flash of light. And that is fire, basically. And uh, can, 
Can you just imagine the first Beatle that tried that? <laughs> Here you've got uh, the Beetle and he needs those chemicals. He goes to the chemistry lab, starts mixing chemicals, and sure enough, you get the right chemicals. Now you have a better Beetle, correct? Well, not exactly correct. What you have is a dead Beetle. Because with all the rest of the, without the rest of the apparatus, you're going to blow yourself apart. And so everything needs to be working and operating at exactly the same time. Otherwise, you get a dead beetle. And so to me, that whole thing looks designed. And uh, eliminate one of those pieces. And guess what? You don't have a working bombardier beetle. Okay, see an enemy. That guy is hunting. Uh, you see all those tentacles there. At the end of every one of those uh, tentacles happens to be a poison dart missile system. It is spring loaded. There's poison on the tip of this missile and um, it's tethered, etc. And when a fish comes along, it hits that trigger, opens the trap door, the missile fires. And what happens when that happens then? The missile fires and uh, now this uh, sea an enemy gets a meal. But you don't want to eat one of these particular sea anemones, do you? Well, there is a creature that will eat the sea anemone, darts and all. He's called the sea slug. And he digests the entire sea anemone. The only thing that's not digested are those poison missiles. So what's he do? These, they're all rattling around his stomach. Well, he notice he has tentacles of his own but no ability to manufacture his own poison dart system. And so he takes those darts from the sea anemone, transports them up into its own tentacles. Once put in place, the first fish comes along, bam, this thing fires again. So what you are looking at is a creature which pirates another's missile system and uses it for his own. That's but the interrelationship between the creatures in the animal kingdom. All right. We always like to talk about the living jackhammer, the woodpecker. He makes his living hitting his head against a tree, which with such a force that if it wasn't for design features, his eyeballs would pipe out of his head and his beak would fold up like an accordion. And the reason it doesn't happen that way is that he has a shock absorber between his beak and his skull. And there is a special film that comes down over the eye every time he hits his head against a tree. That keeps the wood chips out and the eyeballs in. Very important for a woodpecker. And you say, man, that's a dumb bird hitting his head against a tree. Well, he's hungry. And we all do strange things when we're hungry. He hears an insect on the inside of the bark of the tree. He's going after it. And he would actually uh, uh, manage to get it. But the bug isn't dumb. It scooches uh, down the bark of the tree through some of its tunnels. And the woodpecker would starve to death. Except for another design feature of the woodpecker. And that's the long tongue. The tongue is anywhere between three and a half and four and a half times longer than his skull. It has sticky barbules on the end and he slaps that tongue down into the tunnel and uh, sticks to the beetle or whatever it is down in there and boom, into his mouth. And so that's a unique system. But what's he gonna do with that long tongue? You know. It's so long, if he um, tries to put it in his mouth, he's going to choke to death. If it leaves it hang out, he's going to peck a hole in it, probably chop it right off. So here's the storage compartment for the woodpecker and also these flickers. And the tongue comes out of the back of the mouth, wraps around the skull, attaches up there into the beak region. It's stretchy like a rubber band, and uh, there are special muscles that pull this thing down into the chest cavity. And all of this thing, to me, speaks of creation. 
The reason we like to use it, as well as Lanny Johnson, who is uh, one of our um, uh, speakers here, he actually was heading up our children's ministry, still is. Uh, anyhow, uh, Lanny was an atheist when he heard Mary Jo talk about the particular form and specter. And as an atheist, he said, how do I explain that as an atheist? And the more he thought about it, the more he started studying and he realized that his evolutionary ideas didn't work. And you might say Lanny Johnson, um, some of you know him as Eugene, the lion puppet. But anyhow, Lanny jo Johnson ended up coming back to the Lord. Uh, see, he was saved in a VBS and then drifted away because of the evolutionary naturalism. He was one of those students chained uh, to naturalism. But fortunately, Mary Jo's lecture helped get him out of those chains. Uh, but anyhow, now Lanny, at least for many years, you would, uh, Lanny would see over 100 kids come to the Lord through his vacation Bible schools that he taught, which is a creation-based VBS. And we have that VBS system, uh, uh, VBS uh, whole package that you can order from the AOI bookstore here. And it's a very powerful one. And Lanny likes the power in it because he does not want kids to be taken captive like he was taken captive. And so you can see that at discovercreation.org and get more information. Uh, the giraffe, amazing, a tremendous design. Uh, we have to think, so we need blood to our brains. Well, think about that giraffe. It needs blood to his brain too, but that's a long ways up there to pump the blood. Now your heart is about the size of your fist, okay? And uh, so while your heart is pumping to get blood to the brain, going, love, dub, love God, love, dub, love God, the giraffe's heart is a lot bigger. It's going kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. You see, it is about two feet to two and a half feet long. Wow, that's a big heart. And so that's a lot of blood pressure. But think about the problem that could arise when that giraffe bends down to take a drink of water. Now you have all that uh, blood pressure and gravity working on that uh, flow. And that poor old giraffe should blow his brains right out of his ears. But you see, that doesn't happen, does it? And that's because there are special valves within the neck of the giraffe that closed down at precisely the right time. It's actually muscles working as valves and uh, that restricts that flow. And then there's a spongy mass of material inside surrounding the brain. But now, have you ever stood up too fast? What happens when he hears a growl in the bushes and here comes a lion? What's he going to do? He's going to throw that head up into the air, right? Well, he'd get dizzy and fall over and become good lion meat. Except that those valves open as quickly as they shut down. And that spongy mass material releases the blood in a very consistent flow. And so all of this to me speaks of the design of the giraffe. Well, we're looking at great design features. Think about your eye. The amazing design that is. And uh, whether you're talking about the lens, which one of the people we've just trained in Costa Rica, who happens to be a eye doctor, loves talking about the design of the eye now. And uh, not only does that, but he is now sharing that with other people. And he and a group of others have been part of our, one of our uh, uh, students, as we were teaching people how to teach uh, creation to English, Spanish speakers in Costa Rica, um, native Costa Ricans, basically. Um, he's taking the ball and running with it. But it's amazing design. But how do answer, evolutionists answer for that? What do they have to say? 
Well, they point to an imperfection and they use what they think is a perceived imperfection. It says, Richard Dawkins says, uh, basically, whoops. All right, I'm gonna have to do that. Okay, Richard Dawkins says, it's not design. If it was, it's absurd design. There's a mass material right in the line of vision. If it wasn't there, we'd be able to see better. Uh, hmm, is Dr. Dawkins right? Well, partly, yes, we would be able to see a little bit better, except there's also a way of a ma around the mass of material that's between the lens and the back of the eye. And that there is a fiber optics that actually transport the vision. And not only that, but it turns out that if Richard Dawkins walked outside on a very bright, uh, sunny day uh, with the eye design like he thinks it should be designed, he would be blind in about two hours. And the reason is that massive material is the best pair of designer sunglasses you can possibly own. So I think God knows what he's doing. Now we're going to pick on Richard Dawkins. And uh, he talks about uh, how we chew food and how we breathe. He said, why do you realize that you swallow food with the very same tube that you breathe with? Why you could choke to death? And then he calls this uh, thing that we call design. Uh -uh, it's not design. If it was design, it's the height of stupidity. That's Richard Dawkins. Very arrogant arguments that he uses. Well, I say it is design. I see it superbly engineered. Everything put together very nicely in one compact space. Um, for instance, if you didn't have the air and you get something stuck in your throat, how did you get it out? We can cough it out, can't we? But how would Richard Dawkins do it if he designed it a different way? Would he have to uh, use a plunger to push it down? Uh, maybe send a fish hook down and pull it out. Um, where would Richard Dawkins put more tubes? And how many tubes will he need? And the fact, the way it is designed, it makes speech possible because speech is not only hot air. You're thinking, well, that's what I'm hearing tonight. No, uh, it's not only air, but it's also the position of the tongue um, and the mouth um, and all of that uh, coupled with the air. And so it makes speech possible. So I see an engineered system like the Swiss Army knife all put together in one little compartment. That's an amazing design, amazing designer. Uh, think about my computer, how well designed that really is. Now, um, hmm, yeah, but your brain is better than my computer, much better. It can work faster. And uh, it's interesting to think about it because your brain is a really a tremendous computer processor and beyond. Okay, think about the number of uh, uh, switches in your in your brain. A single brain has more switches than all the computers and routers and internet connections on Earth. And that you can find out in page 65 of that book, The Design and Complexity of the Cell. And then he says the total number of synapses in a brain roughly equals the number of stars in 1,500 Milky Way galaxies. And that's just one brain. So how did naturalism explain that? Here it is. An early cell billions of years ago developed sensitivity to other cells. Then it is conceivable it would be on its way to becoming a human brain. See, that's naturalism at work right there. Okay. And the words perhaps inconceivable aren't really scientific terms. It is a statement of hope, hope of naturalism. 
that you can explain everything without God whatsoever. Well, you hear many times about junk DNA, uh, how so many things is junk. Well, it's not. When you actually look at it, there's a, the DNA is a computer system. And in fact, if you take one strand of DNA from one of your cells, there's enough storage capacity on that particular DNA strand, which is going to code for so much in your body. But guess what? That one strand will have more information than a set of encyclopedias reaching from all the way from the here to the moon and back several times. That's one strand of DNA. And so it's a, D, it's a computer system. It's amazing. Dr. Robert Carter has a video out called the high tech cell. And he calls uh, the DNA the most complex information storage mechanism in the known universe. Well, that's just the DNA right there. And I love what he says about this. Dr. Robert Carter says this in his video, the genome is a multi-dimensional operating system for an ultra complex biologic computer. Hmm, multi-dimensional, yeah. And then it says it has a built-in error correcting. Don't you wish your computer had built-in error correction? And it has self-modification codes. When it needs to have a new code, it modifies it. He said there are multiple overlapping DNA codes, RNA codes, and structural codes. 22,000 or so protein coding genes create several hundred thousand distinct proteins. I see design written all over that on the high-tech cell. And you can call that in at our office if you want that uh, high-tech cell. It's amazing. <clears throat> well, I just looked at a few design things right now. Just a few. That's all. But you know what? The naturalist has an expert in every one of those things. In fact, they said, we can imagine how mutations working with natural selection, acting over millions and millions of years, might refine or produce systems. But when I look at the DNA and the complexity and the how it is actually sends an electron down to repair itself, when I see all of that, I say, not likely. I can't imagine that. But when naturalism says we can imagine, I have to say one thing. The word imagine and the word might are not scientific terms. And, um, <laughs> and so let alone produce systems, it's nothing but a hope. It's taken a very difficult subject for naturalism to explain and using the word imagine to try to explain it away. You know, tomorrow evening from 7 to, to 8.30, uh, Mary Jo is going to be talking about how mutation and natural selection, that's the buzzwords for Darwinism. That's supposedly how the might and perhaps takes place. Uh, that by mutation and natural selection, you don't need design, they'll say. And you're going to find out that that whole idea that evolution produces or proceeds by mutation and natural selection is a bankrupt idea. And uh, you're going to find out junk DNA is not junk. And we're going to have to hear even more what happened to our good creation. We're also going to find out from Mary Jo that human DNA is very different than apes even though they say it's so highly similar. It's just not correct at all. And then as well as that, you're gonna hear some of the best proofs for evolution and why they fail. So tune in tomorrow for that. My question to you right now is, which one of these is not or was not designed? Which one of those? Hmm. Well, that's a hard question, isn't it? Which one wasn't designed?
If you go by uh, intricacy of flight, you realize that the hummingbird is definitely better than that airplane. Hmm. And also, if you watch that dragonfly, you will see tremendous in intricacy of flight. Both of those are better than the airplane. So if I had to choose one based on how well they perform, I'd say, oh, this one wasn't designed, but we know better than that, don't we? Well, what about lift? Aha, we've got airplanes that can lift. I can lift 15 to 25 times its body weight. <laughs> So I would say that, the, again, the dragonfly has it over that airplane. All right. Think about that dragonfly for a minute. There is a book that was written by Stuart Burgess and, uh, uh, or Statham uh, Burgess. Uh, no, it's, it's Stuart and his uh, cohort, Statham. Uh, that talks about the intricacy of the wings of the dragonfly. And in it, he says something about the dragonfly. When it starts off, it's like a submarine in the larval stage. That is also amphibious, which means it can climb out on land. Uh, it can climb out of the water and turn into a helicopter without any factory or group of mechanics to help. And so he sees design, I'm, I'm sure. And now he compares the wing structure of that particular uh, dragonfly and they're trying to build a better aircraft at least better flying machines and drones using the technology of the dragonfly so if we have to study dragonflies to get better technology then that tells me the dragonfly was designed first several years ago Dar uh uh Michael Bay wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box, and he describes certain things in the human body and in cells, etc., as irreducible complexity. And what he mean or meant by that is if you eliminate any one of the parts of a system, none of the system works at all. So you have to have, if evolution is true, every piece together, all of them working and in the right order, and then somebody has to set that mousetrap, correct? Because uh, just the pieces doesn't catch it. Hmm. He called that irreducible complexity. Eliminate one part, none of it works whatsoever. Well, let me think about one system you have in your blood that you're all familiar with. How many got a cut? in the last 100 years. Now, I'm sure we all did. The reason we did not die happens to be because of our special blood clotting system. And within our blood, we have a substance called fibrin. That's a piece of the first word. Fibrin is a long sticky molecules and makes a web or a net across the blood vessel. And here, now they know by using magnification what is actually going on there and uh, that makes such a good web that the blood cells can't get beyond it but now think about it that's your first step in making a blood clot but what happens if you have a bunch of fibrin floating around in your blood right now well you die uh, you'll have blood clots throughout your entire system so fibrin exists in an inactive form called fibrinogen. Now, when you get a cut, something's got to activate fibrinogen or turn on the lights to make fibrin to make your blood clot. So what activates the fibrinogen? Well, it's a piece of the second word, thrombin. Thrombin activates the first one making the blood clot. But what, happen if, what happens if you have a bunch of thrombin in your blood right now? Well, you die again uh, because it'll activate all of it. You're, you're dead. Uh, hmm. So it exists in an inactive form called prothrombin. And when you get a cut, guess what? Something's got to turn it on. What's that? An activated form of the Stewart factor. 
It turns out all of these chemicals are needed, all needed to be activated or turned on. The entire system works or none of it works. That to me shows a design engineered, uh, you might call that a Rudy Goldberg type system. It's a, a structured system there. But how do you even go from, let's say, the um, inactive Stewart factor to an active Stewart factor? Look at all these extra steps that are involved in that, too. They had so many different names that they ran out of them. They called this one factor the Christmas factor right here. But that's just for one of the types of blood clotting systems that we all depend upon. And so what I'm saying is this all speaks of creation. It is a very complex uh, system that's going on here. And it's not just because it's complex. It's the type of complexity. It's how one thing has to be there in order for another thing to work as well. Well, Scientific American now answered that and said, oh, Michael Bay doesn't know what he's talking about. And he talks about the blood clotting system and he comes, they come up with a perhaps we can imagine explanation. Well, that sounds really good. We're not going to go into those details. Uh, but Dr. Jonathan Cervati answered Scientific American and showed how that was such a grade school based explanation that they're trying to give. Uh, anyhow, um, uh, if you want to know more about that, contact me. I'd be glad to discuss that with you. Um, and uh, that's the perhaps or scientific explanation. Uh, and it's not very scientific. Dr. Michael Denton wrote a book in 1984 called Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. And then he updated that book in 2016 in a book called Evolution, Still a Theory in Crisis. But in his book, originally, he described the cell as being like a city. And he said, if you were to expand the city, the size of a large city, and enter into it, you would define yourself in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. Well, he first said that before they really even understood the complexities of, the, uh, of one cell. They didn't understand it. They saw enough complexity that says, whoa, this is amazing. Extreme complexity. Bewildering, for sure. All right. One of the things that has come to light even after Michael Denton's original book are uh, what's going on in the area of nanotechnology. You've heard of microbiology. There's also even smaller items and it's under the nanobiology you might call it uh, and i like to say think about it uh, look at your little finger you have more uh, molecular motors and machines in the end of your finger than there are motors in the entire world and that's gasoline engines as well as electric engines and there are over 20,000 different types of molecular machines in humans, in our cells alone. All right. Hmm. In fact, these are very sophisticated. All right. Here's one of them. This is a, a, a central motor that actually going to produce energy for you. It's actually made up of strictly proteins. And the proteins work like a an electric motor. And there's a motor and a shaft, a, a stator, all that kind of stuff. So what we're looking at is a motor that turns at 9,000 revolutions per minute. And it's on a scale that you'll never see it with your eyes. You have to have extreme magnification, like even uh, the most sophisticated scanning electron microscopes to even understand what's going on. And according to David Godsell, who's a cell biologist, molecular machine modeler, he says these machines that make crucial energy are one of the wonders of the molecular world. Uh, 
And in fact, um, it's based on 32 proteins and it's all powered by protons. It's absolutely amazing. And, uh, but anyhow, how do you get one of those things? How do you get one of those machines? Well, first of all, it starts with that DNA. You've got an amazing uh, computer program with a lot of instructions in it and a lot of code to tell you exactly what should be made. And what you do is have to, first of all, unwind this thing. Then you've got to split it. Now you take a picture. So you have underwind, unwinding machines, a splitting machine. You're taking a picture of the piece that you want to use to code for a specific protein. So it's got to be copied and cut. You take the copy, you cut it, and then you call UPS to transport this thing. And uh, that transports it into, look at this, don't get lost in any of the details, get the bigger picture here. But look at those little polka dots there. And those are called ribosomes. So this little chunk of computer instruction is transported by UPS into one of those polka dots. And that then tells this particular machine called the ribosome, that's the polka dot, and it'll actually take the computer and make a long string of beads made up of amino acids, okay? And that's what's necessary to make the exact protein. And so what happens, it's a long string of beads, but it's still not gonna work for that machine. So what you have to do is take that long string, you're gonna call UPS again, and now call it over to another apparatus. And when it comes out of that apparatus, it's folded just perfectly. And now it's going to be workable in that Yes. All right. And now here is an actual thing. What's going on inside of your cell? Never known before until the last several years, but very high sophisticated electron type scanning microscopes have been able to show that there are things inside of the cell that is manufacturing highways based on proteins, high ways, get that? And then there's this transport machine that's going to take that protein in a bag of other ones, and it's gonna run down this highway to deliver it over to the other side of the cell. Now, this is sophisticated. This is bewildering complexity and a supreme technology that's going on in here. And this is happening inside of your cells. And you didn't even know that this was happening. This guy is going so fast, it would be like me running at 120 miles per hour. Wow, that's amazing. Howard Berg from Harvard University calls these machines, these molecular machines, the most efficient machines in the universe. We like efficiency. And the whole study of nanotechnology is to build things in miniature and also to figure out how things are really working. To me, the more I read, the more I see of nanotechnology, the more I have to praise our amazing creator God. And he has put the detail into it. To me, I see whether it's the DNA that codes for what protein is necessary or the final machine of the 32 proteins, I see it's all created by God, including then later the cell and then you eventually. All right. So anyhow, yeah, Richard Dawkins, we picked on him before. Let's pick on him just a little bit again. And he says, do you realize there are four ways that that DNA can get the very same amino acid, which is one of the beads on the string 
or for making a long protein, four ways of getting the same thing. He said, that's redundant. That's wasteful. There can't be a God. I can do better. And that's Richard Dawkins again, uh, one of the uh, leading atheists in the world today. But anyhow, the problem is he said that when he didn't know what that last letter that last letter is all makes all the difference in the world. Remember the folding machine? When this thing goes into a folding machine, goes into here, wherever it is, then it comes out as a perfectly folded protein ready to do its job. All right. That last letter actually tells how long inside the folding machine it has to be to get to exactly the right shape. So there's no redundancy whatsoever. There's a timing in the folding and the degree of the folding. In fact, the 2014 article in Frontiers in Genetics talks about the whole idea. What they said was redundancy is not redundancy. It enables translational pausing and tells that particular folding machine what to do. Junk DNA? Uh, um, it all looks designed, doesn't it? No, there's no junk whatsoever. And we're going to find out there's an article by Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, uh, Tompkins. He says, human genome, 20th anniversary of being able to read the genome. It said this whole thing they call junk DNA hits the trash. And your Mary Jo is going to talk more about that tomorrow. Do you realize the faith it takes to believe in naturalism, to believe that chemicals can be bombarded by electricity, lightning, to make amino acids. And then it's absurd that the different types of amino acids line up at exactly the right order with each bead being a different amino acid to produce a working protein. Let's look at the probability of getting one protein. Well, here it is. It's like filling up a universe with blue marbles and hiding some red marble behind some galaxy. And then putting somebody in a spaceship, blindfold them, send them out as far as they want, any direction they want. What's the chance that they're going to be able to make that particular protein, it's one chance in, or uh, what's the chance they're gonna find that marble? One chance in 10 to the 260th power. And understand that's a big number. There are only 10 to the 84th power marbles that would fit into the entire known universe. And uh, so what it is like finding that marble three times in a row, and if you could do it, that would be 100 million times easier to make protein. And uh, keep in mind, it takes DNA to make proteins, and yet it takes proteins to make DNA. Uh, in fact, about 70 proteins make DNA. So which came first, DNA or the proteins? It's a big problem for evolution, isn't it? And consider the ribosome. The ribosome that's actually going to uh, take the computer instructions and make that protein, it consists of over 300 proteins. So you're not only going to have to get one, you're going to have to get 300 proteins all perfectly working. And then the synthase machine is 32 proteins. And so now you've really uh, increased your odds exponentially each time exponential to the 300th power, exponential to the 32nd power. I understand why Dr. Michael Denton, even before he knew the complexity of this, said the cell is like a city. It really is. It's so complex, bewildering technology. And by the way, we just looked at the protein, not the whole cell. An atheist and agnostic calculated the probability of getting a full, a whole cell. Their probability showed that it was one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. 
and they said it was more likely for a tornado to sweep through a junkyard and from the debris produce a Boeing 747 complete and ready to fly. Wow, it's not going to happen. Then they were quoted by the newspaper saying there must be a God, but they did not go out and buy a Bible to find out about that God. They said, we're still looking for a way around our conclusions. And the reason? They're committed to naturalism. It's, they've been chained to that philosophy, the worldview. You know, George Walls talking about the accidental origin of life, uh, he says it from a naturalist viewpoint, naturalism. Time is, in fact, the hero of the plot. Why, we have two billion years to play with. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible. The possible, probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. Well, guess what? That's just slap a coat of paint on it. And it never answered anything. And I don't care if you have billions of years. Uh, it's not going to work. I did the mathematics behind it. And no, it's not going to work even with billions, more times billions of years. <clears throat> Summing up here, Dr. Scott Todd said, here's an answer. Even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Do you understand students are put in a box, chained to naturalism, aren't they? And not allowed to see the light of day. And uh, God says, wow, his creation, it's evident. That's why I keep saying evolution is not science, it's philosophy, it's philosophy of naturalism posing as though it were science and it's convinced and taken a lot of young people captive okay it really has colossians 2 a see to it that no one takes you captive through the philosophy and vain deceit and i think a lot of our students are being taken captive every day well there's so many articles coming out with the more of the supreme technology almost every day. And uh, it's a great day, as my friend Dr. John Morris says, to be a Bible believing creationist. Okay, so much in favor of our uh, creator being the creator God. Science is crying out creation, isn't it? But better than that, let's find out who the creator is. We find out God is an artist, He loves beauty. He yeah, doesn't he? And not only loves beauty, but uh, <laughs> but he also colors everything precisely. But but we see in the intricate details of this uh, of the creation that he made, we see tremendous design ability, supreme technology that only a god could do. And yet naturalism says, well, we just have to wait; they'll figure it out. Well, that's just the hope of naturalism. But we find that our God is interested in detail, but we also find he's interested in the big picture as well. And um, it says in scripture, God numbers the stars. He calls them all by name. That tells us that he's a powerful creator God. And uh, But the verse just before this verse, verse 3 says this God is so powerful, heals the brokenhearted and their wounds. Wow. That means we have a creator God that's powerful enough to heal our wounds. And we all can't get through, none of us gets through this life without wounds, do we? And so, but this is a God who cares and has the power to do something. Now that is a God that's worthy to be worshiped. He is worthy of our praise. So I believe that true science cries out creation. All right. The evidence itself bears witness to that, doesn't it? So I believe you can believe the Bible. Grand design. God made it. Okay. So that's why we call this series Science Cries Out Creation. Okay, so we hope you all discover creation 
worship that creator God. All right. Now, if you don't get our newsletter, make sure you sign up for it. And um, it's um, Think and Believe it comes out once every two months. Uh, we would like to tie what's going on with the uh, in, in the world around us as well. And uh, that article, you might have a big chuckle about my article on how not to use bear spray. Personal experience, okay? <laughs> we do. Uh, uh, we also do uh, tours uh, from a creation design, flood, fall type perspective, like for instance, Costa Rica. If you're interested in it, let us know. And we'll set the dates. Hopefully, we can find something that works with you. Our Yellowstone tours, the dates are already set. And uh, so there's still a little bit of room there. So you can sign up August 26 to 31. And or you can choose September 2 through 6. That is great for you, great for your family, a good way to expose them to the creation message in an amazing, beautiful place. All right. Uh, we do a Twin Peaks family camp coming up in just a couple of weeks as well. And so make sure you just talk to us or go to our camps and tours page right here on our website at discovercreation.org. Okay, there it is. Um, and you can get things on our store there. Find out about events and our speaking events if we got them up to date. Okay. Or if you're interested in creation teaching, you can do that as well. One of the big things too, we're really encouraging people to donate to the Ministry of Alpha Omega Institute so that we can continue doing this type of ministry, whether it be in person or Zoom or camps and tours. 